This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. It's the Blood Red Podcast, courtesy of the Liverpool Echo. I'm Guy Clark. Thanks for joining us. Ibrahima Kanate has already arrived, but Liverpool's summer spending spree is waiting for the trigger to release the domino effect for those heading out of the exit door. Coming up today, we'll be discussing which player could be the key to the market moving, as well as the Red youngster who signed his first professional deal today. Here to debate and discuss, we have David Lynch, Matt Addison and Dan Kay. Gents, I hope you're all well. Lynch, I'll throw over to you first. And I suppose we're, we're sort of going to be talking about transfer policy today. So I suppose for those unawares, just the uh, sort of the lay of the land, as it were, for Liverpool in this, this summer window. Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> there's a degree of panic set in amongst certain twitchy supporters about the fact that, you know, Canate wasn't followed in by three or four more signings. Um, but I think, you know, we, we saw this exact same thing happen last season in terms of you know, there was there was one at the start, wasn't it? it was Simicast, and then you had to wait, and then it was you know Jota and Thiago came in together towards the end of the window, and I think you know there's just sort of a, a case of of Liverpool sort of seeing where things lie, seeing where the opportunities are, Um, you know I'm, I'm sure they're ready to pull the trigger on a couple, but it's just a case of you know knowing what the squad's going to look like later in the window. It's you know I think it too much gets made about the idea that they need to sort of generate funds through sales. I don't necessarily think that's the case. I don't think Liverpool are skint, although they've been hit by COVID as as hard as other clubs, obviously. I think you know that there's a certain guarantee of sort of future income. So it's not, you know, the case that Liverpool are really in trouble financially and they can only buy players when they've when they've sort of sold some. It's it's more of an, an idea of sort of knowing what the squad looks like and those spots for foreign players and not wanting to sort of just leave anyone in the reserves or anything like that. And I think they're a bit they are confident that, that some of the fringe players will start to move on or they'll get a hint that, that, that something's starting to move on that front. So I think it's just a case of delaying that the incomings till till later in the window, but I don't think anything to panic about yet. I think some of those in, uh, outgoings rather are starting to move. We're seeing that now, um, so yeah, it's it's just a, a, a bit, bit of a pause for Liverpool, but I think there's it's going to get busier as the window progresses. Yeah, definitely. And, and Dan, it's sort of it is one of those, isn't it? People getting edgy. We are still in the first week of preseason, sort of getting back underway. And I suppose it's four weeks tomorrow till the the first Premier League game of the season. So I think it's just a case of everyone's got this nervous energy for the season to to begin and the transfer window being open, and and maybe sort of don't quite know how to direct it right now. Well, yeah, there is a sense of nervous energy amongst some sectors of the fan base. I mean, without wanting to kind of stereotype, I do think it's. It is a bit of a modern phenomenon how some football supporters seem to kind of almost place greater store in transfers and transfer windows than goals, football, we're winning matches and trophies. Obviously, it's important, but it's not the be all and end all. And you know, I, I think you know another key factor in all of this is it's 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 a tournament summer, so the window is always slower when the vast majority of players, agents, coaches, everyone's focus is on you know, in international tournaments, which obviously is literally, you know, it's not even been finished for a week. Um, obviously, the other factor as well is this summer, like last summer, obviously it has the shadow of of COVID hanging over it and, you know, the the enormous financial strain that that has placed on the entire footballing industry. So the days, you know, in a perfect world, yes, you know, obviously you, you'd always like to get your buys in early so they all hit the ground running for the first day of pre-season. But the reality is that was never, ever going to be a possibility this summer because, a lot of the best players are involved in in summer tournaments and are now off resting their weary bones after a long, arduous, you know, sh- compressed season. So, um, you know, patience, as David rightly said, there is absolutely the watchword. Unfortunately, and you know, not just in football fans in modern society, that's some people don't know the meaning of the word. Do do, do they? So, I think you have to accept some people's heads will fall off with all this, and you just have to kind of let them get on with it. The most important thing, I think, to bear in mind is Jurgen Klopp and Michael Edwards and the people that really matter at Liverpool Football Club will not be panicking. They have a strategy over the five or six years that they've been at Anfield. The way Liverpool have conducted their transfer businesses has been in many ways been a model for the rest of the game to follow. And I think we have to place our trust in them to do to do the right thing for the club, as they have done basically since the day they walked in through the door. Yeah, definitely. Sort of what rather than who, Matt, is kind of on your shopping list if you were in charge for the Reds this summer? Where do you think the the focus, the energy does really need to be sort of directed? 
I think it's it's been the same for a while. I think there's there's two obvious sort of places. I don't think they would have let Gini and Alden go without having some sort of plan. And I think you have to sort of bring somebody in in that position. But I think you know that that probably will happen. It's just the case of can they move Marco Gruic on? Can they do a couple of other bits first? And I think the other obvious thing is to to bring in another forward. Again, it, it's not necessarily something that has to happen straight away. David references the, the Jota deal that kind of came out of nowhere. It was just sort of done very, very quickly last summer. And, and that kind of thing, I think, would be would be ideal for, for Liverpool to look at again. So, yeah, look, I think in an ideal world, they would bring in those two players. They they do that and, and get that sorted and, and over the line as, as soon as possible. But I think if you ask Jurgen Klopp, you know, if he had to go into the season with the players he's got now, obviously with the centre backs, with Van Dijk and Gomez back, obviously we don't know quite where they are, but it looks like they are going to, you know, be able to to play some part certainly straight away when the season begins. I think if you asked him, he'd be be really relaxed about it, and, and not just publicly, but but privately as well. I think obviously there's been, you know, quotes from him talking about the calmness across, you know, not just Liverpool but the Premier League as well. You look at. Obviously, Jaden Sancho is is a big one. Manchester City are being linked with players, but they've not actually, you know, got that done yet. Chelsea again being linked with Erling Haaland, but that hasn't, you know, happened yet. I think if you ask Jurgen Klopp, genuinely, he'd be be pretty happy to to start the season with the group that he's got now, and that's what you've got to remember, isn't it? The group of players there is already better than what it was last season for the signings, for the players returning, and you know, I think you know this group of players have, have proven pretty much. You know, the, the same group that they can win trophies, they can challenge, they can compete. And that's all you can ask, really. I think it would be a, a good bonus. I think it would be important and, and it would certainly make their lives a lot easier next season if they can get one or two over the line. But look, it wouldn't be the end of the world if the season was tomorrow and Liverpool had this same squad. I think you could deal with that. Yeah, David, Dan sort of said before about it being a tournament summer and the market can be slower to move after that. You've written today sort of about one of the, the stars of Euro 2020 and Manuel Locatelli and actually sort of his future could well be sort of, I suppose, the unlocking of Liverpool's summer transfer sales, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Sassuolo being in, in for Gruwich is... Um, is an interesting one. Um, I think I think the player's preference is still maybe to go back to Porto. He enjoyed his time there, uh, really enjoyed working with the coach, and, and and he did well in Portugal. So I think that that would be his preference. But Sassuolo would be an interesting move, and if you know they they're certainly going to it looks like they're going to have the cash to to start making moves like that if they do sell Locatelli for the fees that are being mentioned around fifty million euros. And I think I think there's quite a lot of of European clubs are in a similar situation in terms of it just maybe takes a couple of deals to start moving. To move other things on so for example you know Sancho is another one in terms of that will probably grease the wheels in terms of, of getting Daniel Mallon to, to Dortmund as a replacement and then you start seeing that they will they will move for a replacement and you know all it just needs a couple of deals to start going and um, to, to get things moving I, you know I, I just don't think it's that unusual either that, that clubs are waiting until late in the window to do the business I think one of the biggest frustrations I, I read in social media mentions and things is, oh, well, you know, if this this target and this target is going, then, you know, we're running out of players to possibly sign. I, I think people fail to conceive the idea that 90% of these people who get linked to Liverpool aren't targets for starters. They, you know, knock down, I knock down some of them occasionally right in. Some of the rest is not even worth it because of the stick you get. Um, but, you know, no one was saying last summer that, Oh, we've got to get Jota into the club. Uh, he, you know, he's got to sign for Liverpool. His name came up about two days beforehand, and then the deal was done. So, you know, I think people need to step back and think. Clubs are doing business later in the window. There's only very few Premier League clubs who've actually done anything so far, and also there are plenty of footballers you haven't even thought about signing for Liverpool who, who could possibly end up at Liverpool by the end of the window so there's a lot of possibilities out there would you know again sort of reiterate that point about don't panic there's you know there's a lot of movement to happen as you mentioned like Locatelli and Grilich and, and things that can happen in the window and you know Liverpool I'm sure will will get some extra players in. Dan's got his training gear on he's ready to go if they want to give him the call <laughs> there he is uh, Dan, no, it's a... I don't feel it. 
<laughs> no, Dan, coming to you sort of on the uh, on the transfer front, and I suppose on Gruwich and the interest maybe from from Porto in him, but also as Dave is saying about Sassuolo as as well. I suppose for Liverpool, it's kind of that catch twenty two situation, isn't it, of being a Premier League club? Because when they go shopping in Europe, they're held to ransom because mm -hmm. these foreign clubs know they've got the money. But when it comes to offloading a player and, and feeling as though, say, a fifteen million pound price tag is fair for Gruwich to maybe a Premier League side, for these foreign leagues, especially, I know we're not talking about a French side here, but we've seen the collapse of their deal. The finances aren't always there so much and they do need to move these players on before they, they can then replace. That's that's the thing, isn't it? And, you know, and a, a degree of pragmatism might have to come into play at, at, at some point because, you know, you can't, you can't reiterate strongly enough, obviously, the impact that, the last 18 months have 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 had on football clubs finances and obviously it's it's a sliding scale liverpool have been hit hard but further down the food chain clubs will have been hit even harder so they have less cash to play with so where you know there's a number of players obviously isn't there that you know there's been a suggestion that liverpool have been looking to move on in the last well last summer as well the likes of Origi and shakiri who you kind of think in a perfect world they should be able to get a decent fee for them because obviously these are proven international players who've performed a bit sporadically for Liverpool at the very highest level. But clubs that maybe in the past would have been able to pay what Liverpool wanted, whether that's 15, 20 million or, or, or whatever, would now be looking at, at a lower fee. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily translate into Liverpool being uh, quoted cut price field, cut price deals for the players they want. So that that, that is the that is the the, the the awkward nature of the position that Liverpool find themselves in. But, you know, we, we've seen from Jurgen Klopp and, you know, the, the the people who were involved in transfers at Liverpool over the last four or five years that they will not be strong-armed into doing what anything that they're not comfortable in doing, whether that's by other clubs or even by, you know, pressure, um, for want of a better phrase, that might be asserted from certain sections of the fan base on social media. They won't be intimidated or kind of pushed into doing something to appease people because... They want to get the fans off their back. If you know, if, if they don't feel the right value is out there, um, you know, Jurgen Klopp make, makes has always made a great play of saying how much he believes in the players that he's got, not just in his first team squad, but also the younger players coming through. We've seen how you know he's been prepared to give younger players uh, their heads when he feels the time is right. Um, yeah, we're going to move on to talk about you know some of the young players that um, have already sh you know shown good signs getting Liverpool to the Youth Cup final. The, the, the yes, they lost the final, didn't they? But yeah, they, they, and two uh, of the last three finals they've been to as well, though, haven't they? Right. So, so yeah. um, you know, and, and you know, I, I think a lot of supporters, obviously, we, we all like a nice high-profile sign. We'd all love to see Mbappe or Haaland or whatever. But but just as satisfying from the supporters' point of view, I think, is when a young player comes in and proves himself worthy of playing at this level. And you know, there's, there's a lot of high hopes within Anfield for. Um, some of these talented, some of these talented youngsters. So hopefully, yeah, we, you know, I, you know, I, of course, I'd like to see a couple of players then through the door. But we need, you know, th this isn't 1999. This isn't 2002, where you know you, you need a mass overhaul and you know a, a squad needs to be constructed. This is the team that over the, you know, the squad, by and large, over the last two or three years won the Premier League, the Champions League, and even you know, despite an unprecedented injury. Um, epidemic almost last season still managed to pull out, you know, a, you know, well, to finish third in the Premier League and get into the Champions League. So it's fine tuning rather than a major overhaul that's needed. And people just need to calm down a little bit. But whether that's going to happen on social media, I wouldn't hold my breath, put it that way. Yeah, I wouldn't be, yeah, I wouldn't be sort of too certain on that. Um, Lynch seems to be having a few technical issues. Hopefully, he is all right. Lynch, can you hear us? Yes, I can, <laughs> thankfully. Uh... Hopefully that's sorted now. Yeah, no worries. Matt, I'll sort of throw over to you. Last sort of point on, on Gruwich and things. When Locatelli was banging in goals at the Euros, I think it was Switzerland, he got his two goals against. Everyone was keen to link him to Liverpool and say what a brilliant, complete midfielder he would be. Any chance of, I don't know, I'm putting two and two together and getting 12 here, but Gruwich for, for Locatelli with some fee involved? I wouldn't have thought so. I think uh, Locatelli is one of those that, again, it, he does get linked with Liverpool. He's not the only one from the Euros. Nicolo Barella is another one that has kind of popped up on, you know, transfer rumours and, and stuff like that. But you do wonder just, you know, how much is, is that off the back of 
you know, the, the Euros. I wonder how many Liverpool fans had watched Manuel Locatelli before the Euros, for example. And All of them. Suddenly, are, are desperate for him to, to come in and, and play for, for Liverpool. So, I don't know. It's it's one of those. I think um, it, it wouldn't massively surprise me to see that suggested somewhere or another, just because you know, I think uh, Sassuolo will be keen to up the price as much as they can for, for him off the back of, of the Euros. If they can put Liverpool's name in the mix, that will mean that you know, maybe Arsenal go in and, and bid a little bit higher, which obviously would help Liverpool. But yeah, in terms of, of the player being of interest to Liverpool, I would be surprised. I think you know we, we, we kind of see these kind of swap deal type things. We've seen it with Sal Niguez and, and Barcelona and, and that sort of thing that's been taking place over you know the, the last few days. Liverpool fans obviously want him desperately as well. So they're kind of keeping a a close eye on, on what might happen there. But yeah, it's it's very rare that a swap deal would happen. I don't think that would happen. And I think for, for Liverpool, they will have other targets. But yeah, the, the crucial thing really is just that Marco Gruic gets a move. I think he's 25 now, Marco Gruic. And, you know, that's certainly the point in his career. I think, you know, certainly you you probably would have, have thought for, for him, for Harry Wilson, one or two of these other players, they probably would have moved last summer. And I think that's kind of, of the problem really for Liverpool. They're kind of doing two summers worth of sales in one year which you know when there's not exactly a load of money you know sloshing about across Europe that that really isn't easy so yeah the the priority I think is is to move Marco Gruic on whether that's Sassuolo, Porto, somewhere else it doesn't really matter for Liverpool they just need to get as much money as they can open up that squad space and and move on from him really. Yeah, we've moved Lynchy on. He's decided that the, the internet issues are, are too much for him, unfortunately. So we'll sort of carry on for the, the second half of the pod without him. It will be interesting, obviously, on the outgoings also to, as you say, Matt, they're sort of trying to condense two summers worth of sales into one and see what does end up playing out with Divock Origi, Jordan Shakiri, Harry Wilson as well. Do stay tuned across the Liverpool Echo, of course, for all of the latest going ons. But really want to talk, Dan, about sort of the youth policy at Liverpool for the second half of today's podcast. And that primarily brought around by Mateusz Misilowski signing his first professional contract with the club. And it is something now over the last two or three seasons, we are really beginning to see a focus on youth development at Liverpool with a clear pathway to first team minutes. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's that's hugely important for for the club. I think for the kind of, for the whole mood music surrounding the club, um, you know, it's, Liverpool is an international club, you know, and, and will always has to be in the market for the top players and has been in recent years. And that's why they've been competing and for and winning the top prizes. But, you know, as, as I said, you know, just a couple of minutes ago, it's 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 really good when you can kind of blend that with a young thread coming through and you can marry the two, because I think the, the, you know, the two can feed off each other. Um, obviously, you know, for the young players to be able to train and play with, so the world's top performers, that's only going to improve them and make them better players. While at the same time, I think, it, you know, f- for the big stars, and, you know, I think it should be said as well, Liverpool have seemingly made a conscious effort. When they, Even when they're buying the big players, it's not just about their ability, it's about their character, the kind of people they are. You know, there's, there's no there's no massive egos there. Um, even some of the biggest stars, the likes of Salah, Alisson, Van Dijk, you know, these, these world superstar players, do seem to have a very down-to-earth nature. And I think... Ha- them having that kind of a- awareness that their their influence <clears throat> and how they carry themselves will be learned from, will be fed off by the young players, I think can bring the best out of them. Um, and so, you know, also as well, you know, Liverpool has spent over... When, when, when did the academy and Kirby get, get made? Late 90s? So, you, so, you, so you're talking, you know, well over 20 years, you know, close to a quarter of a century. And apart from that kind of initial influx of the likes of Fowler, McManam and Gerard Owen... Mid, mid to late nineties, you know, there was a period of time when there weren't that many players that came through and actually really made it into the first team at Liverpool, and and it, and, and it was a, it was something that was discussed for what you know for, for quite some time. They're applying tens of millions of pounds into this academy, but where, where's it going for? And it does seem like in the last, you know, in recent times, there's been a real concerted effort to really kind of fine tune that and make sure that the academy is punching its weight. And I think we've seen that in in recent years with the likes of Curtis Jones, um, of you know, you, 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 you know the, Reece Williams, you know, o- other players that have Trent Alexander us. Arnold. Well, sorry, yeah, <laughs> the, the most glaring example. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I nearly did did go without saying. Trent has the chance, I think, potentially to go on and become 
one you know one of Liverpool's best ever young players. You know, it, 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 it's very early days. He's only been on the scene four or five years, but if he continues the kind of trajectory that he's been on, by the end by the end of his career, he could be rivaling Phil Neal for a place in the all-time Liverpool eleven. That's how good I think potentially he can be, and that 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 would you know, and and he's someone. You know, the way academies work now, obviously the likes of you know Mateusz Matalowski, who, who we've mentioned before, you know, he and uh, uh, quite a lot of players have been brought in from overseas. But Trent is a scouser, grew up next to Melwood, who has been, you know, come through the academy since he was, you know, seven, eight years of age. And that really is what an academy is there for. So that that is the dream that, that has to be sold. That is the 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 kernel that has to be put into fans, you know, not just fans' minds, young, young, young lads running around. The, the local parks in Liverpool with the red shirt on, they can look at someone like, like Trent and, and, and see, well, look, he, he, he joined the academy or the centre of excellence, whatever it was, at the age of seven, eight or nine. He's already won the league and European Cup for Liverpool. He would have been playing in the Euros this summer if he hadn't got another injury. That's the pathway I can follow if I train hard, if I dedicate myself to my craft and obviously if I get a little bit of luck. So, that, uh, and like I say, as a supporter, that's what you want to see. You know, there, there's nothing more, as someone who's been, you know, following Liverpool for over 30 years, I've had some great moments. The most satisfying ones are when it's the likes of Trent, when it's the likes of Steven Gerrard. You know, I, I saw him right for, you know, saw his entire career, saw his first goal against Sheffield Wednesday. And it just means that little bit more when it's when it's one of your own. Yeah, it's an interesting point Dan makes there, Matt, I suppose, in sort of distinguishing the difference between a raw kind of academy asset, I suppose, like Trent, to one that has been brought into the club a lot later in his development, such as Musilovsky, who I suppose a lot at the moment down at the academy, you take great interest in academy matters. We speak about it on the academy show here on the Blood Red channel, that Musilovsky, maybe of this generation, could kind of be the jewel in the crown, but it goes once again to highlight the work that, that Michael Edwards does. Yes, recruitment is all driven around the first team. We speak so much about succession planning for the front three. Who knows in the background with Harvey Elliott, Musilovsky and Cade Gordon, they may already be in, snuck back in through the back door. Yeah, that's it. It's it's just so clever, isn't it? There's, you know, little fees. Sepp Vandenberg was about... 1.3 million I think it was you know yep. if you were to sell him you'd make a, a profit on him you only have to think back to, to last summer Keanu Hoover how much was he very very little I think it was about 70 80 thousand that they paid for for him two or three years ago turned a profit of I think 11 or 12 million pounds from Wolves last summer I know he didn't play a huge amount for them last season but I think that's you know a decent sort of money spinning sort of way of, of going about your transfers and if you can kind of not just pay for the academy, which I think costs a couple of million a year to, to run that. But if you can then start to see the benefits of, of that within your actual transfer budget for summers and, and things like that, it, it's just another example, another way really for, for Liverpool to be sustainable and, and sort of work it back and, and do as, as much as they can really to compete with the teams that have got a lot more money than they do. So, yeah, it's it's just so clever, isn't it? I think Musilovsky, as you say, is, is one of, of a few players who could come through You've still got the local players. You think of, of Tyler Morton and, and one or two of those players who've grown up, you know, within the city and, and just on the outskirts of it. All of those kinds of players, I think, you know, well, I'm sure we will see them at some point during preseason in Austria. They are there for a reason and they're there because they're, you know, really, really talented players who, as Dan said before, I think can learn from, you know, Salah and, and Mane. You look at, at Musilovsky at the moment, he must be absolutely loving it to, to be playing in the same position of, of those players to be learning from from what they do, the way that they train, the positions that they take up. I think it's it's absolutely invaluable. And we've spoken about it loads of times in terms of the merging of, of the academy and the first team in, in Kirby. But I think, you know, pre-season when they're spending all of that time together, they're, you know, on and off the pitch together. I think that's when it really comes into its own. Yeah, there is a sheer excitement around Musilovsky and I suppose what he will be able to kind of bring to Liverpool and signing his first professional contract, I suppose, is the first sort of step on the road to that, of course, part of the, the pre-season camp out in Austria. But I suppose it, it sort of leads into to what Matt was saying there, my next question, Dan, in terms of this is a thought-out plan from Liverpool. The fact that Jurgen Klopp, I suppose, has come in. He's, he's been at the club over five years now. He's set everything at first-team level. And now everything below that is already mm. now getting built for this, I suppose, level of success and, and hopefully a dominance for Liverpool to return where, as you were saying before, you have those top pros right at the, the highest level. The likes of you, Jordan Henderson's and James Milner's, setting the example around the place. 
for these young lads to learn from. Absolutely, and it's it's very much a symbiotic thing where you know both both elements can can feed off each other. I remember that you know the <coughs> I was lucky enough to to, to go to Jurgen Klopp's unveiling as Liverpool manager back in October 2015, one of the last video gigs I ever went to, and I remember working on the Saturday morning afterwards. I think he'd been pictured having you know obviously the paparazzi already looking trying to snap him in town. I think he got he got, he got seen having having dinner in a in um so, you know some some restaurant in the city centre. But with you know the, the Saturday morning, ten or eleven o'clock, there were already pictures of him up at Kirby watching an academy game. You know, in, in but essentially his first day in the job. So and and I remember being very pleased to see that kind of thinking. Well, I'm not surprised. You know, to be fair, that's where he should be, because that is that is the bedrock of any of, of any great club. You, you 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 look at the great Liverpool sides of the past. Yes, they would pay money when it needed to be paid for Kenny Dalglish, who was a British record transfer signing in 1977, Peter Beersley the same, but there would always be young players that, that had come through the ranks as well, as well as you know younger players like Ian Rush, Kevin Keegan, bought from small clubs like Chester and Scunthorpe. It's an intrinsic part of having an, a well-rounded club, that it's not just about a Harlem Globe trotter, Galactico policy like Real Madrid have, which ultimately is, you know, yeah, it, it might get you some trophies here and there, but that's not what Liverpool as a club have ever been about. Not, yeah, but maybe it's an English football thing, you know, it's stuff. There are great rivals, of course, but Manchester United have, have been built on for years and years, going, you know, going right back to Matt Busby in the 50s, of bringing through talented young players that that that, that form the, the heart, the sinew of a club, and you build around that. So it's it, it's it, it gets harder and harder, of course, because um not just things like you know the, the the changes in the law over Brexit making it more difficult to bring players in from Europe and so on and obviously it's such a massive market now whereas in the past you know until 15 20 years ago clubs would be looking really only within this country obviously scouting networks now aren't just across Europe they're across the entire world you know Liverpool brought in a, a goalkeeper from uh, Brazil last year yep. didn't they Pitoluga. Pitoluga. yep um, and obviously all the other big clubs are, are also going to be casting their net globally as well. So it's finding that right balance between the top. You know, you want, for me, you always want a scout or two in the team, ideally. Of course you do. But it's about having that right blend between a local heart and the top global talent as well. Um, and, you know, right right from the off, Jurgen Klopp has made it very clear that that's something that he's been looking to do, you know, we even in that first in in that first season, we saw the likes of Ben Woodburn, and you know a young Trent Alexander, young Trent Alexander Arnold, being given their head. It's not always going to work out, you know. Woodburn, who obviously made headlines by becoming Liverpool's youngest ever goal scorer when he when he scored against Leeds in, in the League Cup, you know his his career sadly hasn't really kicked on as yet in the way that Trent's had. So it's never going to be an exact science. It's never going to work hundred percent. But if you're doing the right things year after year, if the right protocols the right structures are in place you're giving yourself a better chance and i just think also as well you're going to have more patience from the supporters i mean listen some supporters will never be patient it's for some people it's always going to be jam jam today and yesterday never mind tomorrow but i think for most reasonable minded supporters having a couple of young players in the side um will I think there's always going to be more patience with them if it's just multi-million buy and buy after multi-million pound buy because people expect immediate results then. Whereas if you've got young players in the side, I just think it's people are more prepared to give them a bit more time to gel together. But when it works, like it has with Trent, it really works. Yeah, obviously there's a big gap between, I suppose, the likes of Salah and Musilovsky when you sort of think about it now in terms of age and profile. And that's why, obviously, the, the here and now is important with what the current transfer policies we were speaking sort of first half of the podcast is all about. But Matt, to me, it's kind of maybe like the, the next stage, I suppose, almost in Michael Edwards sort of leading as sporting director of Liverpool. 1.0, I suppose, being the selling off of squad players for, for very, very strong fees or even first team players in the example of Felipe Coutinho. And then this second phase, maybe, as Dan was alluding to, if you can bring these players in young and spend, what, 1.2 million for Kai Gordon, who then can become a first-team player, you're going to save yourself an awful lot in terms of a transfer fee when he is, hopefully, a first-team player. If another player needs bringing in alongside him, you've already, I suppose, kind of saved on one player's fee to maybe have that money to add the stardust here and there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a new thing either. I mean, you think back 
what is it, four years that Andy Robertson has been at Liverpool now, but that was effectively a swap deal for Kevin Stewart, wasn't it? So it's happened for, for a good while now at Liverpool. There's there's loads and loads of examples. Obviously, you hope that all of these players get through and you know are regular first team players for Liverpool, but the chances of, of that happening and there being sort of five or six, I think, are, are pretty slim. So, you know, you think of, of someone like Ben Woodburn, you probably wouldn't get anywhere near £10 million for him now, but if you'd have sold him at the right time, that could have been, you know, a reasonable fee to, to get for somebody of, of his talents. And he's not going to make it at Liverpool. I think he will move on this summer, but I think you could get, you know, certainly a couple of million pounds for him. That would then completely, you know, wipe out the, the fee paid to, to Derby for Kyde Gordon. And you start that process again and hope that, that he is one that, that makes it. So, yeah, it, it's all about being clever, isn't it? We've spoken so many times about Liverpool's transfer policy. The way that they do things is all about finding sort of value in places that, that people are not looking. Plenty of clubs were, were looking at Kyde Gordon, but with Musilovsky, there was, I think, Ajax and, and Arsenal looked at him, but you know, Liverpool were, were one of very few clubs who'd spotted him. I think they they saw him uh, playing in Bristol in a uh, a youth tournament for, for one of his teams in, in Poland, and, and that's where they spotted him. They then tracked him, I think, the team that they signed him from, a second or third division in Poland, so it's not even you know, an elite team within Polish football. They've had to to go through that process and, and really, you know, dig into to how good a player he is, get character references and, and all of that stuff. It, it takes a, a lot of work, but I think when you can bring these players across and, and do that sort of thing, it's it's very much, you know, worthwhile doing. And yeah, it's it's what Liverpool do better than, than any other team, isn't it? It's finding value, spending that money wisely, Letting players go usually at the right time. Obviously, that's been more difficult for for the last eighteen months or, or so because of various you know factors with the pandemic. But it's just all part of of the big wide transfer policy. Michael Edwards, Mike Gordon, all of the rest of the people that are involved. It's it's generally pretty good for for Liverpool. And yeah, for me, the the group of players coming through now. There's a bigger there's a bigger number I think than than I can ever rem- remember really in terms of having a, a genuine prospect of of making the first team and as we say even if they just miss out and they don't manage to make it at Liverpool they'll make it somewhere and if they do Liverpool will make a, a fairly big profit. Yeah, it's intriguing as well. I think that the Brexit legislations as well is going to be sort of mm-hmm. making it all more sort of important for Liverpool. But I suppose then kind of just finishing off Dan and wrapping up on kind of the podcast and the, and the youth policy thing this season going to be really intriguing in particular to see sort of the development for Curtis Jones and just what kind of player he can crack on to be and, and whether he can kind of emulate Trent's succession into to being a, a first team regular, I suppose. Absolutely. He's the next cab off the rank, really, isn't he? In terms of like the first team he's had. Um, well, it was towards the end of the the championship season, which I still enjoy saying, really. And I hope I get the chance to say it fresher sometime soon again. But it was towards the end of that that he started to kind of really get on the fringe of things. Scored that memorable FA Cup winner against Everton and then scored his first Premier League goal against Aston Villa. The same weekend, he signs a new contract, which bizarrely was probably around about this time of year, wasn't it? Last yeah. July. Um and then, you know, there were moments last season when he kind of thought, yeah, he's really kind of kicking on. And, you know, the, the, you know, it was such an up and down season for Liverpool. There were a couple of games I remember in January and February when it was he was kind of really almost dragging the team forward. I think probably like like it like understandably he kind of maybe got dragged down slightly by the just the difficulties Liverpool had in kind of, you know, getting a team out on the pitch. You know, the the, the heart of that side was ripped out, as we know, because of the you know, the loss at central defence and then that made the midfield weak and that made the attack weaker. But I, you know, often you find with young players, and I think Trent is a prime example of that, um, it's never going to be an upward curve, a, a consistently upward curve. There's going to be ups and downs. And I think Trent has only been able to become the player he has been because of those difficult moments they had. You know, that, that, you know, his first real full season in the side that obviously ended in Kiev. You know, Marcus Rashford kind of gave him a difficult time at Old Trafford and, um, but he became stronger from that. I mean, I think it was just before the, the Champions League quarterfinals against Man City. And I remember City really targeting with, with Leroy Sané on that side and, and he really rose to the challenge. So I've got absolutely no doubts that that Curtis will be the same. He'll learn the lessons that he had to learn. He'll be a year older, wiser, stronger, you know, physically more developed as well. Um, and he just seems to have the right kind of temp, the right kind of temperament, the right mentality. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, it, He's, he's, he has had the right influences around from the likes of Jurgen Klopp, the likes of Jordan Henderson and James Milner, Salah, Van Dijk, all these fantastic professionals. He's had a couple of years now to 
to watch them around the training ground, how they carry themselves, how they dedicate themselves to their craft and their profession. And it's, and it's up to him now, you know what I mean? He's, he, there's no question he's got the ability. There's no question that Jurgen Klopp will give him the chance, but it's up to him as to whether he can grasp it. And, you know, I, I very much that I'm, I'm alone in. I think there'll be a lot of Liverpool fans that really hope that he can, because like I say, it always makes you... It always makes us happy when there's when there's a scouser or two in the side. No, most definitely. Well, that's all we've got time for here on today's edition of the Blood Red Podcast. Do remember to check out the link to our Blood Red Club in the description of this podcast. All it takes is your email address to get your hands on our weekly exclusive Blood Red Club content. But from myself, Guy Clark, Matt Addison and Dan Kay, thanks for your time and your company. It's bye for now. This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo.